Honestly, this really shouldn't work. Huh, I guess it does. Who would have thunk it? Welcome back one and all to StarCraft 2 Co-op, where we focus on the greatest turtle this side of the galaxy, Karax. Face myth for Artanis, and overall, a pretty good guy. I, I am honored to have the opportunity. The last commander available in the pack that I recommend everyone get if you want to get serious into StarCraft, whether you're here for the story, the co-op, the PvP, or you just want to mess around the arcade, take your pick. As usual, this is not a sponsored video, and all the points are based off of my thoughts and experiences while playing Karax for an undisclosed amount of time. However, not being a literal turtle and more the turtle playstyle. This of course means for all you casuals out there that it's a large defense with a side of defense and a very, very, very large cost. Basically becoming the Protoss version of Swan while not using armor as a defense but structures instead. This makes the construction a whole lot easier as one probe is able to queue up multiple buildings at once like setting up a forward base and a defensive line almost at the exact same time. However, armor is still quite the same as is most of his offense abilities as they still play a key role. The only difference between him and Swan is the fact that he still has access to cheap infantry. And when I mean cheap, I mean cheap. Despite being a shield style play with a main side of defense with a very mean offense, Karex works more like a double edged sword, surprisingly. How you distribute your resources becomes key. Focus too much on defense and you won't have any funds for offense, vice versa of course. The true secret to Karax comes from his defenses as the beginning of the game they're not really that scary. But level up the commander enough, both in-game and outside of the game, and you get access to Kalai Ingenuity at level 11. Now the reason why this entire power is also important, especially at level 11, that's like really late, is because this great power can turn the tide of battle, and just remember that great power comes great e efficiency. I, I think that's how the saying goes. Kalai Ingenuity makes the fan favorite pylons, photon turrets, which are classic yet effective, while having new structures like the shield battery and the Kaleidith monolith. Add the upgrade to all of these structures and you can make their build or warp in time almost instantaneous, opening the possibility of winning a game not by building a single combat unit. I know, it's a stupid idea. So then I saw to find out if it was actually true and it was actually possible and it was roughly went like this. With the playstyle of expanding to max out resource production as early as possible while defending points of objectives and bases. Pylons will power up these structures in the area, just make sure to defend them as even though this is a different commander entirely, the mechanics are the exact same and not unique at all. Photon cannons are your main source of defenses and they will tear apart most of the enemies that you will face assuming you're actually building them. With upgrades of increased rate of fire and range which looks small on paper but in game is a very big deal. Monoliths, which is just what they call them because I'm not actually going to pronounce their real name is just as much of a challenge to afford them, having the same upgrades available as the photon cannons but work entirely different at core. Excusing upgrades having a much larger range at base than your main defenses except that shorter rate of fire that it has gives way for a lot more damage potential. Shield batteries. A new structure available to Karax having a relatively large range for its use 
upgraded of course, and using its own energy supply to refuel shields for units and structures alike. Throw on a 200% energy regeneration and it becomes almost unkillable. Well, most of the time. All of the defenses are designed to work together to make sure that the enemy can never get an advantage on you because you cover all sides. From long range artillery support from the monoliths, to sheer overwhelming firepower from the photon cannons, from sheer survivability from the shield battery, and even better, the pylon energy, which actually keeps it all online. Just be sure that once the pylon goes, everything else goes. And you might be asking, why do you defend with such determination for something that does not move? Two words. Global upgrades. Expanding much further than the top bar abilities, as upgrades are available for both your army, your top bar, and your ally. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Best of all the upgrades, energy regeneration. It's not a damage number, but it is very, very useful. While other commanders are limited in their use of these game-breaking abilities, Karax most definitely is not, as long as you pay for all three levels of the upgrade. This makes the resource-starved playstyle into an ability and defense-focused choice that I recommend everyone to do. I except if you're aggressive, then, you know what, whatever, you know. <laughs> With the general reliance on abilities early game due to a very, very slow start, the damage is handled early on with an orbital strike. A toxic spell, isn't that the same as Artanis' ability? Kinda. Really? No, it's actually quite the opposite. For Artanis' orbital bombardment, he uses 50 energy to fire off five very, very powerful shots. Karax is similar but also different as he's able to shoot one shot for every five energy which can then be reduced with an upgrade to three energy. Karax is able to use orbital strikes infused with polar bear friendly technology to save energy on every shot, being able to spend a small amount when needed. Also, when you have too much energy that you have not enough to spend on, hybrids and bosses don't even stand a chance against a whole scout. On the heavy firepower side, with Amon's minions constantly sieging you, you have to deal with rows and rows of them. This, however, is quickly resolved with the Solar Lance. Three devastating beams of energy and targets of your choosing, dealing massive amounts of damage in three areas, again, of your choice, that can later be upgraded to create a wall of blue fire that can burn any unfortunate soul that decides to pass through. Keep in mind that they are different from the orbital bombardment as they do have a cooldown and they cost 50 energy per use. But it doesn't matter because you can reduce the cooldown by 50% and the cost by 40%. I myself am a man of efficiency and productivity and I pride myself very much on it. Which is why the next ability seems a little biased why I love it so much but generally has good application in the use of the game. Chrono Wave. Used at the right time you can boost you and your ally structures by 200% for 20 seconds. So messaging your allies and to trigger the ability would be best. Queue up the research, the units, and activate them. Further enhanced by upgrades like Chrono Overload, which increases the 200% to 500% productivity, while the Architect of War, which is something I'll go into at the end of the video, allows defensive structures to receive an attack speed bonus, no energy required. Now this wouldn't be StarCraft 2 co-op without an overkill ability, right? Right. It goes a little something like this. signs disappearing. The surface of Endion has been cleansed of life. Purifier Beam is a devastating ability to say the least, creating an automatic or manual beam of death that kills structures and units alike. It can be fast if controlled manually, but if not touched at all it will result to its default setting of targeting the closest target at a slow speed. Upgraded with Purifier's Protocol, which increases the speed of the beam from 1 to 3, and the damage from 750 to 1000 at base 
with a 2000 damage against armor targets. It doesn't have an energy cost whatsoever. It would probably take up all your energy. Instead, it has a ridiculously long cooldown to the point where you could take a nap and it still wouldn't be done. If you've been listening closely to the video, some abilities do not require energy at all despite the energy regeneration power. Some, however, don't even require any effort at all. Carex has two passive abilities which can be located on the sides of the top bar. Unlocked at level 2 is Chrono Field, giving you and your allies a 15% production speed bonus to all of your structures combined all of the bonuses you can have on a single building is 545 percent bonus production speed that's fast the second one unlocked at level 7 is probably the better one of the two is reconstruction beam an ability that will automatically heal or repair armored units and structures so terrans and protoss only sorry zerg healing 5 hp to units and 10 to structures Again, this might not seem like a lot, but it is a very, very big deal. This power is balanced out by the fact that it can only happen to three targets at once, which can later be increased to five with upgrades at the Solar Forge. Now onto a topic that I think most of you would be interested in, and that of course is the units. And all I can say really about them is that you're not really going to be able to afford them. The Protoss effect already is bad enough, but Karax here is a resource starve commander. This means it's basically 10 times worse. Essentially, if you have a lot of resources, it means you're doing something wrong like not building enough structures or training units. Basic troops still become a spammable option, but in the later tiers like tier 2 and tier 3 units, good luck affording any of them. Starting out with the Sentinels, a variation of the normal Zealots that each Protoss commander has a unique twist on these units. Artanis has access to AoE with a giant spinning axe, Vorzun has a charging and stunning effect, while Carex has Reconstruction. The ability to rebuild themselves on the battlefield every 2 minutes or 120 seconds, just remember that when it comes to this ability, the cost is increased, which, much to our amusement, has turned from 100 minerals normally to 130. But when it comes to the common reoccurring problem of reconstruction, as they are able to rebuild themselves in somewhat a piece, even though they are vulnerable to attack. As your army pushes forward, it gives the rebuilding of the sentinels space and time to rebuild themselves only to get right back into the fight. With the common problem of air coverage with zealots being, well, absolutely zero, most commanders have some sort of counter, and in Karax's case, it's a more complicated issue as he does, but he doesn't. Energizers. No, not the battery, but yes, the battery as well. An expensive tier 1 unit that is more utility purpose more than combat. I know that all you StarCraft 2 fans are going to say that yes, he can attack and you would be right. But the damage output is just not enough and the health is just laughable. With the focus on utility, Energizers are keeping to the themes of the other Protoss commanders as they become a mobile power field, making troop deployment for Sentinels, other Energizers, along with any of your allies if they choose to be Protoss, easy to deploy. Adapting a sort of haste effect that makes friendly units better, faster, stronger, with increased attack speed and movement speed at the cost of energy. Again, this is another reason why you buy the shield battery upgrade for 300% energy regeneration. Mind you, that is the affordable side of things, as the more specialized the unit gets, the greater the price. Some of his units are the exact same as other commanders, while some are the same at core but different mechanics, and finally, some are completely different and only available for a select few of commanders. Repeated units like the Observers and Immortals, Observers being a utility unit with a detection and cloaking that is capable of bigger vision at the cost of its mobility, while Immortals are walking tanks with a very short short range with a devastating cannon and heavy shields. Both coming from long range carriers being the more expensive side of units, which are way out of the price range of Spamble even if it was possible to gather that much resources that quickly. In all honesty it would probably fry your graphics cards with how much numbers of entities on the screen and lasers there are on the screen. Costing an excessive amount of resources as the carrier, a mobile fighter ship able to deploy 6 mini fighters that will swarm a target with low damage at a high rate of fire. The carrier itself is vulnerable to attacks as they have literally no defenses and relies entirely on their fighters for support. Carriers have the utility side of repair drones being able to heal any nearby mechanical units much like the repair beam.
With the problem of air and ground and really everything for carriers, as when their fighters are gone, they're probably going to be gone too, is air support, meaning the Mirage. A variant of the Phoenix Air Superiority Fighter, if you remember my Artanis video quite a while ago, which has a unique twist on the unit, becoming a state of existence and non-existence. You heard it right, as the unit gets damaged, it flicks between a state of vulnerability and invulnerability at the cost of zero ground cover. But then again, that's just for the carriers to deal with with their fighters, as the carriers are able to heal them, creating a sort of indestructible shield as long as the enemy doesn't outdamage the healing. The Colossi, costing a small fortune of 390 minerals and 260 gas, which is not as bad as carriers, but is still too much to spam. So the spam ability is way out of the question. With a low health bar, every single Colossi you make has extreme value for the amount of minerals you sunk into it. As they are siege units capable of long range support, lighting two lanes of fire on the ground, which is very much similar to the solar lance, even including the fire after effect. The range is never a problem as they are able to climb over your armies and terrain that is normally impassable by ground units. What is the problem though, is due to their extreme size of being 17 stories tall, and that's not even counting the purifier form, which is the form it's taking in this case. It is such a large unit that air targets are able to shoot them as if they were another air target. Finishing off the video like I usually do with the mastery perks, but as you can see on the screen, there's something a little different about this as this was never here before. In the making of this video, the prestige system came out which ultimately slowed the production of the video as it changed the commander in a very drastic way. Power set 1 would normally be structures only, as most of his level 1 to level 15 upgrades mainly endorses structures. However, due to the prestige system, it now comes down to a choice whether you want to be more defensive or more offensive. It's all up to you. Power set 2 has the repair beam healing rate as the healing becomes much more powerful as it heals at a very, very, very faster rate despite having a low HP per second. However, I cannot deny the free energy from activating Chrono Wave every time. Power set 3 is dependent if you want faster troops and economy in the beginning or to have more attacking and defensive power with bonus energy at the start. Now onto the prestige talents, a system that the community has very mixed feelings about, and I don't blame them. Once your commander reaches level 15, this allows you to unlock one of the three other talents, which change the core of the character, while the mastery and the upgrades up to level 15 stay the exact same, resetting the level, have to play through it again, choose another one, repeat. You can switch between any of them whenever you want as well. Architect of War turns the repair beam into only affecting structures while being so much more powerful, while Chrono Wave boosts the rate of fire of all defensive structures. Templar Apparent completely switches Karax's defensive focus commander style into a very offensive commander by greatly reducing the cost of all units by 40% while getting rid of cannons and monoliths. Lastly, Solarite Celestial takes away all the productivity and utility abilities away, massive buffs to damage abilities through cost and cooldown. And that, in a nutshell, is how you play Karax in StarCraft II Co-op. This video has taken a excessively long time to edit, and I have lost countless hours of sleep making this. So if you have enjoyed the video and you want to see more, you can go back to my older videos on the series if you want to learn the commanders that came before this that's on the list and everything in the co-op. And if you're waiting for a commander to come up in this series for me to explain how to play and how to master, be sure to scroll down below and hit that subscribe button to keep up to date with all of the content coming your way. With all this being said, this is Toxic Spill. I hope you all have an amazing day. Remember, do stuff you love. Signing off.